Okay, well, it's a joy to be able to share with you this evening. Uh, my topic is uh, John Nelson Darby. Of course, it's connected to revival. That's the reason we meet together to pray. Uh, but of course, John Nelson Darby lived from 1800 to 1882. And uh, actually, in the last two months, I have read three different biographies of Mr. Darby. So I feel kind of done, reasonably well prepared uh, for what I'm going to share tonight. But I was praying about a scripture that would maybe encapsulate something of the man's life. And as I was reading my regular devotions, I came up with this verse in 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 12. And I'm just going to read it. It says, for our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you, Lord. And I thought particularly as I read that scripture, I thought this, that really summarizes uh, the life of Mr. Darby, Darby uh, in simplicity and godly sincerity. He really lived there, even though he was raised in aristocracy, he lived a very simple life. And talk about godly sincerity. There's no question of his sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom. Uh, he just it was the scriptures. He just wanted what the word of God says. But by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world. And so I thought that was very appropriate as I think of the life of Mr. Darby. You might ask why, why talk about Mr. Darby? Well, part of the reason I want to do this is that the internet is filled with negative remarks about Mr. Darby and uh, what, what we call ad hominem attacks. And the idea is this, if you can attack the man, it's easy then to dismiss his teaching. And there have been many that have sought to, as it were, discredit Mr. Darby because they hate the teaching that he is connected with. And particularly when we think of the teaching, I'm thinking of dispensational truth, and then I'm thinking of the pre-tribulation rapture. And so if we can somehow blacken the character of the man, it makes people just dismiss uh, these very serious theological positions. And so that's what has gone on. And the Internet's full of it. And I'm tired of it. <laughs> and so I, I kind of feel like I want to say something positive on behalf of Mr. Darby. So that's that's why I want to do this. But it is connected with the revival, and I'll, I'll be able to tie that in. But I have to say that my own introduction to Mr. Darby was 40 years ago, and it was from an ad hominem attack. In fact, um, we were getting ready, my wife and I, to go to Bible school, and um, one of the courses that we would be taking was called dispensationalism. Well, I'd never heard of dispensationalism, and I didn't want to show up at Bible school and be ignorant, although maybe that's the best way to go, in a sense, with an open mind. But anyway, so I decided I would order every book that I could get on dispensationalism. And so I got several. One of them, of course, was uh, Ryrie's book, Dispensationalism Today. Another one was a book, and it was called Backgrounds to Dispensationalism by a man called Clarence E. Bass. And it was really an attack on Darby. And his basic thesis was this, because Jay and Darby was a schismatic, what that means is he was involved in division. Of course, there was a division between the open and exclusive brethren in 1848. And of course, he's often blamed as the source of it and all the rest of it. And so his basic theory was, well, because he caused division, therefore, dispensationalism must be wrong. But anyway, as I read the book, it was my first kind of introduction to Mr. Darby, and he had a short biography of Darby's life, which absolutely captivated me and still does to this day. And when he would quote from Darby, uh, and uh, especially as he was talking about dispensational truth, uh, and he'd quote the scriptures, I would check the scriptures, and it said exactly what Mr. Darby said. So I don't know whether this guy intended it, but by the time I'd read that book, I was a convinced dispensationalist, and Jay and Darby was one of my heroes. And so it, it, it had completely the opposite effect of what Mr. Bass intended, but nevertheless, it did leave me with a deep respect for this man. And so what I want to do this evening particularly is um, look at um, him from the perspective of the people that knew him best. And so I want to I kind of look at um, testimonies 
of people that walked with him, some of them for 30 years, some of them for 40 years. What was their impression? Because it's easy for somebody 150 years down the pike to turn around and say, oh, Mr. Darby was this, Mr. Darby was that, and they're so removed from it. What did the people of the time say about him? Also, why, why connect this with revival? Well, let me just say this, that I'm convinced that revival, as well as, of course, changing the perspective of God's people, making them more on fire for the Lord Jesus, which is what we need and what we want, but also it's usually connected with a restoration of truth, truth that had been neglected or truth that had been lost to the church. It's restored in power by the Spirit of God, and often there are instruments involved in that restoration. I believe Mr. Darby was such an instrument in restoring truth that had been neglected by the church for a long time, and God used this man to bring this back. And I have no question in my mind that the, the Brethren movement, if you want to call it that, that Mr. Darby was connected with, was indeed such a revival. It was a restoration of truth. And of course, um, every revival is a sovereign work of God, but also every revival has zealous men who are connected with it. So the kind of the Wesleyan revival, you've got men like Whitfield, Wesley, uh, both John and Charles and lots of others. Uh, same here with this revival, uh, we have Mr. Darby connected with it and others, but I, I particularly want to focus on him tonight uh, because if, as we're praying for revival, what we need is a new generation of men with a zeal for the glory of God, for the truth of God, and for the souls of men. And I think that you will find that those three characteristics were very much seen in Mr. Darby's life. And so I want to just acknowledge that he wasn't a perfect man. Uh, one person who knew him said that the two Adams were more clearly seen in Derby than any other man. <laughs> well, that's quite a statement, isn't it? The, the two natures, if you like, were seen in him. But let me remind you that the best of men are men at best. And there's only one perfect man who ever walked this earth. And the world crucified him. That perfect man, as we know, was the Lord Jesus. And so God has used imperfect instruments in revivals and still is using imperfect. Aren't you glad, by the way, that he's still using imperfect men? If you could only use perfect men, none of us would be useful to the Lord. And so we're just thankful about that. But I want to tonight highlight the admirable qualities of Mr. Darby in the words, as I've said, of those who knew him and were close to him to try and combat all the negativity uh, out there about him and his ministry. By the way, it was his own principle never to defend himself against personal attack. And I think that's a wise position to take. I think it's much better to let the Lord be our defender. He did not get involved in um, trying to defend himself. He left his testimony in the hands of the Lord. I think that's a wise thing. So I want to begin by thinking about his zealous labors in Ireland. And of course, uh, of course, being married to an Irish wife, coming from, although English, but I Irish ancestry, and from a Catholic background, uh, when, I, when I read in that biography of his tireless labors to reach the Roman Catholics with the gospel, I fell in love with the guy. Anybody that would, would serve like that it, it has got my admiration. And so that's part of the thing. But I want to talk about it. It was born into this wealthy family who were connected with Leap Castle in County Offaly. And although he was born and raised in Westminster in London, he, he went to Westminster School. And all that's very close, by the way, to the Houses of Parliament, really is very much in central London. So that's where he uh, was educated. But then when it came to college, he went to Trinity College in Dublin. And he was a classical medalist in Greek and, of course, proved himself to be marvelous in terms of linguistics. Of course, he, he was able to preach in French. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, he was also uh, went to New Zealand and was able to learn Maori well enough to actually preach in Maori to 
the natives. So this man's got great language, linguistic ability. He's involved in Bible translations in French, German, Italian. <laughs> so, I mean, just brilliant linguistically, but he started out in university as a classical medalist in Greek. And then, of course, he studied to uh, become a barrister, which is like a prosecuting attorney. And um, he uh, decided not to pursue that, even though he was called to the bar and received, of course, his license to, to, to um, function as a barrister. But he never actually practiced because his conscience wouldn't allow him because he knew he had the ability to pervert the course of justice by persuasive arguments. And so he never practiced law. Instead, he went into the Anglican church. He didn't last very long in the Anglican church, probably two and a half years, something like that. And uh, he, as he left the church, he said it wasn't the sacramental and priestly system that drove him out from the establishment, deadly as they were, he said, in their nature, but he saw that it wasn't the body of Christ. He said in the entire parish, there was perhaps not one converted person. So how could it represent the body of Christ? He said, this is not the body of Christ. He also believed in a divinely appointed ministry. He said, if, if the apostle Paul was to come to their parish, he would not be able to preach because he'd never been ordained as an Anglican priest. But he said, if a wicked ordained man came, they would have to welcome him into the pulpit. And he said, there's something not right with this system. And so um, he became convinced before the Lord that the system itself was worldly and corrupt. And so he was converted at 21 years of age through the reading of God's word alone and not with the help of man. Just reading the scriptures, of course, we shouldn't be surprised, right? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Uh, that from a child, you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation. Uh, these are his own words. I was a lawyer, but feeling that if the Son of God gave himself for me, I owed myself entirely to him. And the Christian world was characterized by deep ingratitude towards him. Now, what a sad statement. The Christian world was characterized by deep ingratitude toward him. I longed for complete devotedness to the work of the Lord. My chief thought was to get around among the poor Catholics of Ireland in a wild, uncultivated district where I remained two years and three months, working as best I could. The people were almost as wild as the mountains they inhabited. And this was in County Wicklow in Ireland. Going from cabin to cabin to speak of Christ, he was seldom home before midnight. He didn't fast on purpose, but his long walks through wild country, and as he ate what food was offered, food that was unpalatable and indigestible to him, he began to have an emaciated look. This had quite an effect on the Irish peasants. Such a phenomenon intensely uh, excited the poor Romanists who looked on him as a genuine saint of the ancient breed. The stamp of heaven seemed to them clear in a frame so wasted by austerity, so superior to worldly pomp. One person commented that a dozen such men as Mr. Darby would have done more to convert Ireland to the gospel than the whole apparatus of the church establishment. He was moved not by asceticism, nor by ostentation, but by a self-abandonment fruitful of consequences. And that's the thing that in reading these three bi biographies, if I would say one thing about his life, that would be the characteristic thing, self-abandonment. He completely abandoned self to serve Christ unreservedly. And that to me is highly commendable. And so certainly Darby never married, uh, and consecrated his whole life for his beloved master, Jesus Christ. So here are some of the descriptions of his influence upon others. This is Francis William Newman. He said, a most remarkable man who rapidly gained an immense sway over me. 
I shall henceforth call him the Irish clergyman. His bodily presence was indeed weak, a fallen cheek, a bloodshot eye, crippled limbs resting on crutches, a seldom shaved beard, a shabby suit of clothes, and a generally neglected person. With keen logical powers, he had warm sympathy, solid judgment of character. He had practically given up all reading but the Bible. Everything he said was based on texts aptly quoted and logically enforced. Never before had I seen a man so resolved that no word of the New Testament should be a dead letter to him. For the first time in my life, I found myself under the domination of a superior. And you find this a common thing, that Darby had a profound impact on those that he was around. And um, they just recognized the, <laughs> uh, the caliber of the man. William Kelly, who was Darby's personal friend for over 40 years, and the editor of Darby's 34 volumes and the synopsis of the books of the Bible, said, I have ever regarded J.N. Darby as a great and good man. And the terms rarely go together. I thought that was interesting. The terms great and good rarely go together. But he said they were definitely seen in Mr. Darby. Another man, uh, Julius Anton von Posseck, uh, he worked with Darby on the German translation of the New Testament and knew him for about 30 years, wrote of him, you could not be in his presence more than a few minutes without soon feeling you were in the presence of a great man and even greater servant of God. I've often wondered at God's grace in Jay and Darby, which was able to sustain him in such healthy spiritual simplicity for so many years, in spite of the increasing amount of human praise surrounding him. And that is a remarkable thing, isn't it? To, to be constantly praised by men and to stay simple and spiritually healthy in that environment is a remarkable testimony. Walter Scott, famous for his commentary on the book of Revelation, he said, it has been the experience of most men brought into personal contact with Mr. Darby that the influence exercised over them was overwhelming. His marvelous power in grappling with principles and tracing their application to their legitimate results, his simple and unaffected piety, combined with the ripest scholarship. He says, uh, and unqualified, uh, unequaled ability in expounding the word of God, accompanied by generous appreciation of the good and excellent outside of the ecclesiastical sphere in which he moved, fitted him to become, as he undoubtedly was, a recognized leader in the church of God. So what was he like as a teacher? Don't you often think, I would have loved to have heard some of these men preach. And what I've read is that Darby, first and foremost, was a gospel preacher, and that he rarely preached the gospel without somebody getting saved. And actually, a friend of mine who only reads Darby, that's all he reads, that's apart from his Bible, he just reads Darby, and I said, what's the secret? What's the code? How do you get in? Because he's not easy to read. And he said, his answer was this, read his evangelistic sermons. He said, if you start there, you get to the heart of the man. He's first and foremost an evangelist. But anyway, this is, this is what people said about him as a teacher. William Kelly said of Darby, he was a preeminent logical power who had a deeper insight into God's mind than any other I knew or heard of in any age since the apostles. Now that's quite a statement. <laughs> Isn't that an amazing statement? Credible. A deeper insight into God's mind than any other I knew or heard of in any age since the apostles. A conference was held in London in 1845. Only on the afternoon of the third day did JND rise to speak. And this after a well-known friend alluded to his silence. Mr. Darby explained that he had not spoken because so many brothers had a great deal to say. It was a most impressive discourse 
for after many of the leaders had spoken with considerable power and unction, he gave a terse summary which set their main points in the best position. He brought a flood of fresh light from scripture on all of them. So again, amazing to think of this. Now here's uh, for our French brethren. This is a description of his preaching in the French language from Vevey, Switzerland in September 1871. It says, all day, all day long he argues, he explains, he answers, and in the evening he can, he can still hold an unprepared talk for an hour and a half without appearing to tire. His manner recalls that of the speaker in the British Parliament. His style is that of conversation. Although he speaks French fluently, his language is stripped of all ornament. It is bare, simple, confidential speech, although rarely trivial and of great power. He repeats himself frequently as barristers do in their pleadings, but his repetitions, which generally relate to the essential points of Christianity, are like hammer blows on the head of a nail. His expressions are that of a convinced man, enthusiastic about truth, and whose soul reflects the splendor of heavenly things. The invisible world does not appear to him, but as a great reality. He has seen it with his heart and spirit. The Lord Jesus is his friend as much as his savior. Darby also was known for his love for the poor of the flock. Often he, there would be, everybody would be clamoring to host Mr. Darby when he came to town to speak. And he would ask, well, who normally hosts the brethren? And often it'd be some humble brother. And he said, well, that's where I'll stay. He didn't like pomp. He didn't like being made a fuss of. And uh, also he had a great love for children. And um, you know, I read a biography recently of a, a sister in Canada who uh, remembers sitting on Mr. Darby's lap. Uh, her dad had drowned at sea and Mr. Darby took care of all the arrangements to make sure their family were cared for. But she remembers this, this dignified old man sitting on his lap and just him paying absolute attention to her. So it's just amazing. He, he was very simple in those ways. Um, he hated being treated as a celebrity. Of course, what more could we say about his wonderful hymns, his Bible translations, his voluminous writings, his influence on systematic theology, particularly in the area of ecclesiology and eschatology. Our understanding of the church and our understanding of end times owes a great debt to Mr. Darby. In one area particularly, which I believe God raised up John Nelson Darby specifically to deal with. And that is this, the era of replacement theology. When you read what the church has written and the church has done to the Jewish people prior to Darby coming on the scene, and I'm thinking of men like Martin Luther, who, who encouraged uh, the persecution of Jews, uh, terrible things that they did. And so he, the era of replacement theology is like a cancer in the church that has not only caused it to violate God's word concerning the Jewish people and Israel, but turned the church into an instrument of hate and not love for God's ancient people. And that's a tragedy. But Mr. Darby, I believe, has helped rescue the church from that terrible, terrible indictment. And uh, so uh, there's a lot more could be said, but um, our time is gone. Uh, but I, I just wanted to get across that these people knew him well, and they spoke very respectfully of the impact of Mr. Darby. I said at the beginning, was he perfect? No, I don't agree with everything that he taught either. <laughs> I'm not a blind Darbyite, but a man who lived a life of such self-sacrifice and zeal for the Lord and for his glory and honor is a man who I can do nothing but respect and thank the Lord for. And I'd say 
may his tribe increase. And you know, if we're going to see revival, we're going to have to see men of a similar stamp raised up by God for our generation. Amen.